next speaker for today, uh, Mr. James Pirenay from Belgium. He's the head of the Community Engagement Companion Animal Program for Four Paws. With more than 15 years of experience in the field of animal welfare and conservation, he specialized in companion animal programs. He joined Four Paws in 2016 as an EU policy officer, where he worked on campaigns to reduce the illegal puppy trade and regulate the online pet trade in Europe. In March 2017, he was appointed head of community engagement as part of the Four Paws International Companion Animal Program. And of course, I'm going to switch to, uh, to English straight away. So my presentation today will be about stray dogs being a human problem, but not just a human problem, also a global problem. And when I say stray dogs, I don't mean just the mixed breeds that we can often see on the streets, but also pedigree dogs. Because as we talked about before, pedigree dogs are still often bred, acquired, kept, and relinquished in a very irresponsible way. I will also talk about the importance of addressing root causes when it comes to stray dogs and looking and understanding human attitudes and human behaviors. And finally, I will introduce you to FOPO's innovative community engagement approach to address dog population management. So let's, uh, let's start. Just a few words about the human dog bond. I know that some speakers before have covered this a little bit. Humans and dogs have coexisted for thousands of years. I think we have traces of first relationships between dogs and humans at least 50,000 years ago. It is a relationship that benefits both species, both humans and the dogs. Dogs have held different roles for humans since the very beginning, from protecting humans to hunting for humans, as we just saw previously, and also providing companionship. But today, most dogs are companion animals. And these dogs become stray dogs only because they're abandoned or born on the streets. So it's not a secret that dogs are men's best friend, and we, as humans, have a duty of care towards dogs. And when I say we, I don't mean just animal welfare organizations or pet owners, but everyone, every stakeholder, every stakeholder has a duty of care, including breeders, veterinarians, local and national authorities. Everyone has a role to play. What is, what is a stray dog? Sorry, I don't want to shout too loud. What is a stray dog? We usually say that there are two categories of stray dogs. We first have the stray dogs that have an owner. They can be the owned roaming dogs. They can be lost dogs, pets, or abandoned or relinquished pet dogs, and also working dogs. And then we have those who don't have an owner. They're the dogs that are born on the streets. Although we could argue that at the very beginning, these dogs also had an owner because they didn't fall from the sky. They ended up on the street because somebody put them on the street. That's how they started reproducing. This diagram is just to show you a little bit more about the role that humans play. But as you can see, we've got dogs on the streets. Owned dogs are abandoned and they just stay on the streets. Lost dogs end up on the street. Sometimes they will find back their, their home in, but it's very, very rare, especially when they're not microchipped and registered. And then we have owned roaming that sometimes will come back to their home, but very often they spend their life on the street. So we got lots of dogs that end up on the street. We got another category here, which is very common in the countries where we run our projects is also neighboring communities dropping stray dogs in other communities 
or dogs migrating from one community to, to the other. So, and then we have the last category, which is the, the, the dogs born on the street. And we can see that for all these categories, there is always at the source of the, pro of the problem a human home. So this shows the role that humans play in the fact that dogs are on the streets. But why are dogs abandoned? Well, it's mo mostly because of irresponsible pet ownership. And as one of the speakers mentioned today, irresponsible pet ownership is the result of a lack of knowledge and information. I'm just going to mention here some of the reasons why pets are abandoned. So we've got dogs that, that are bought on impulse, like Julie just mentioned before, very often driven by fashion and trends. We have the dogs that are acquired by owners who don't necessarily look at their own lifestyle before acquiring a, a dog. We've got dogs that are abandoned because people move into rental homes and very often, unfortunately, Owners, rental owners, will not allow pets. Very often, people acquire dogs and don't spend enough time on canine education. And this results in abandonment as soon as the dogs start showing behavioral problems. Medical issues is also a reason for abandonment because people can't afford vet costs when the dogs are get sick. Another reason is when dogs get old, they can be abandoned. And life changes also are a reason why people abandon their dogs. For example, if people move abroad or when there is a divorce in the family, there's often, it, always, it often poses a problem for, uh, for the animal. And here, I would already say that Breeders have a role to play because breeders can do a lot of work in informing prospective owners they acquire a dog. Um, okay, as I said in my introduction, stray dog is not only a human problem, it's also a global problem. And we, very, we focus very much on stray dogs in terms of the dogs uh, living on the streets. And we can say that these are the visible dogs. They're the ones that we can see. And there's thousands of stray dogs around the world. We estimate the population, I think, today to around 500 million dogs. But we also have an issue with stray dogs in Western Europe and North America. If you ask people in Western Europe if we have a problem with stray dogs, they will always say no. Well, in Belgium, where I'm from, which is a very small country, it's 11 million people, 30,000 square kilometers. I know Mexico is 2 million square kilometers. I don't know how many million people. So Belgium would be the si as big as the size from Mexico City to Aguacalientes. For you, it's just down the road. Well, in Belgium, on that distance, every year, 60,000 pets are abandoned. 60,000. And this is growing, again, of course, with the lifting of COVID restrictions, but also with the current cost of living crisis that we are facing. So the numbers are increasing. The thing is that these dogs are not visible. They're invisible. They're the invisible strays. Because we have a system in place in Western Europe, in most Western European countries, where dogs are collected, picked up immediately from the street and brought to shelters, which means that we can't see them. But we do have a problem with stray dogs. So yes, the problem might be bigger in less developed countries, but highly developed countries also have a problem with stray dogs. Let's look at some of the problems caused by the presence of dogs on the streets. 
So these are the problems for people. In terms of health, dogs may cause, uh, may transmit uh, diseases like rabies, so zoonotic diseases. In terms of safety, aggressive uh, dogs may be aggressive, especially when they roam in packs. They can become aggressive or during mating season, they can get more aggressive and threat uh, humans, but also other animals like pets, but also livestock in farms or um, in farms. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, stray dogs may cause also traffic accidents. In terms of community well-being, as you can see, loves dog, uh, lo dogs love sorry, um, f um, eating from garbage, and very often they leave a lot of garbage open on the streets, but also sometimes in people's properties. And dogs also bark, um, especially when they get involved into fights or during mating season. And then, of course, stray dogs can be a problem for um, hotels and restaurants uh, because they feed out of the leftovers and um, it's a, it can become a problem in terms, of, uh, in terms of tourists. But the problems are not just for the people. The problems are also for the dogs, and the dogs suffer immensely from living on the streets. And usually the life of a stray dog is much shorter than the one of a known dog. Let's look at some of the problems for the strays. Well, if you see, in terms of health and welfare, there's a, lack, they have a lack, there's a lack of food, shelter, and vet care. They get lots of, um, they're exposed to diseases such as distemper, mange, but also fleas. Um, also, uncontrolled breeding. Females suffer a lot from uncontrolled breeding because they get bred by, sometimes by several males, and they also have to feed more puppies than their body can really maintain. In terms of safety, dogs get involved into fights with other dogs. Again, especially during mating season. Mating season is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, also in road accidents. So get, dogs get injured and um, can, can die in road accidents. In terms of community well-being, well, still too many people mistreat um, animals on the streets. Local authorities tend to take quick and easy solutions to remove animals from the streets and bring them to shelters that are already overcrowded. And culling, unfortunately, is also one of the uh, quick and easy solutions that local municipalities around the world do take. And sorry, in terms of tourist um, um, dogs, stray dogs get poisoned in hotels and restaurants so that they don't bother um, their, their customers. So as we can see, it's all about humans. It's all about attitudes, it's all about behaviors, it's all about interactions in the, at the center, sorry, are the people. So stray dog is a human problem. And if we want to address the issue in the, uh, the uh, improve the welfare of the animals in the long term, but also improve the well being of the community, we need to work on changing these attitudes and behaviors. But what do we need to know about people? Well, if we need to work on, if we want to know what people think, so looking at understanding attitudes. We need to go into the community and run, conduct attitudinal surveys. Otherwise, we will never know what people think about dogs in general, but also about the presence of, of stray dogs. And here are just a couple of, a few questions that are part of surveys. For example, at Fobos, we use surveys before starting community engagement projects. And, uh, but these surveys can, of course, get, um, quite long because there's a lot of topics that we need to cover but I just put here a few questions um, like what do people th how do be what do people think towards uh, strays and own dogs what's the connection do people make the connection between strays and own dogs what are the principles of responsible pet ownership in the community what are people's concerns about stray dogs why will people tolerate community dogs if they're healthy 
not aggressive and sterilized. And once we know what people think, then we need to understand what people do, how people behave towards dogs and stray dogs. And this is where we conduct behavioral surveys. And again, just a few questions that we can ask ourselves. Why do people own dogs? How do they treat their own dogs? Do people let their dogs roam and why? Why do people abandon their dogs? Why do, what do people do with unwanted puppies? So we really need to understand the situation in the community if we want to address the issue in a, in a defective and sustainable way. So once we have the information we need in terms of uh, regarding attitudes and behaviors, how can we fix the problem? Well, unfortunately today, still too many municipalities and around the world opt for quick and easy solutions. And the common solutions that we see happening are a lot of mass killing, culling still happening, euthanasia, indiv that's indiv indiv euthanasia of individual animals, but also building shelters. But of course, these solutions, these approaches, have their limitations. They're reactive, so they don't address the root causes, they just address the consequences, they just try to fix the problem caused by the presence of the, of the dog, the dogs without looking at why the dogs are on the streets. They're inhumane very often, culling, euthanasia, locking animals in shelters is not a human, not a humane uh, thing to do. They're not really realistic. They're not sustainable. They're very, they're like just quick and easy uh, solutions. But the problem, the problem is that the problem comes back very quickly. Like just for example, in Romania, in 2014, there was an incident with a stray, uh, a, a child was um, attacked by a, a stray dog and the municipality of Bucharest decided to pick up all the uh, dogs from the street and they gave 14 days to the owners to come and pick up to collect their, their animals. But of course, the majority of these animals were not chipped, so we couldn't find the owners. And they said after 14 days, if they're not collected, we'll just kill all the dogs. And that's how they got rid of the dog population, of the stray dogs in, um, in Bucharest in 2014. The problem is now, if you go back to Bucharest, and I do go back, go to Bucharest quite often for, for work, the dogs are just coming back. They're coming back from the, from the um, neighboring uh, villages. So the problem is not solved. It's just postponed. And they're inefficient, because if these solutions were working, the problem would be solved. So what we need to do is look at alternative approach. We need solutions that are effective, so we need to address the root causes. We need solutions that are proactive, and we need to work closely with the, with the community. Solutions should be humane. We should really focus on the welfare of the animals. They should be realistic, which means that we should look at the relationship between people and dogs. And they should be efficient, and usually it's a combination of interventions. So basically, the solutions that I presented just before were just animal-centered. It was about the animal. The action was just on the animal. These solutions, the solutions should be people-centered. If the problem comes from human attitudes and behaviors, at the root, and, and it's the root cause, then we need to work on, 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 on the people, with the people, on the people, on changing these behaviors and attitudes. And how do we do, do we do that? It's really important to put local communities at the heart of the solution and empower local leaders. So how do we work at Four Paws with local communities? Well, for many years at Four Paws, we did 
focus our efforts on in Eastern Europe on catch, neuter, vaccinate, and release programs. So over these years, we sterilized and provided care to thousands of dogs and cats. And in 2018, we changed our strategy. And this is where the community engagement approach comes in. We changed our strategy to move from being a service CNVR service provider to becoming a more strategic partner with communities and municipalities. So cl working more closely with, with the people. And not just sterilizing the animals, but really working on attitudes and behaviors. This was done to enable communities to manage stray dog in a humane and also in a sustainable way. So these are the countries where we work uh, in Eastern Europe. So we focus a lot of our efforts in Bulgaria, Romania, and Ukraine. Unfortunately, our projects have been highly impacted uh, by the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, since the beginning of the year. However, we still manage to provide care to thousands of dogs in shelters by providing, setting up a platform for shelters to get food for their animals, but also support to people. And I will talk about the project that we run, which is animal assisted therapy. We are providing in Ukraine uh, support with former stray dogs that we train to become therapy dogs. And we're supporting sold, injured soldiers returning from the war, but also children in refugee camps. And I just have to say this, we have a fantastic team in Ukraine uh, who are incredibly resilient in these very difficult times. And um, yeah, just need to mention this. So our community engagement approach, what we do is we really try to transition from being this service provider year after year to really working, as I said, more closely with local municipalities. But the change can be done from one day to the other. We have to accompany local communities and municipalities in this transition so that they can take ownership of the problems in their community. So we have a set of tools that we offer to communities and municipalities. I will develop, I will talk a little bit more about these tools a bit later, but these are the different tools that we have. So catching to relieve, uh, catching to vaccinate and release and vet training. We have an, a, sh a shelter adoption program, uh, animal assisted intervention program and responsible pet ownership education and campaigns. I will um, talk about them a bit later. So our community engagement process. Well, when we talk about changing attitudes and behaviors, it takes time. We can change things from, as I said, from one day to the other. So we need to allow ourselves to be patient and to take the time to do that. That's why usually our projects will last, I would say two to three years with different phases. In the first phase, we identify the municipality who we're gonna work with and also the stakeholders who will be part of the uh, project, so the leaders. Then we facilitate a series of community workshops to help the stakeholders develop their own community action plan. So the action plan with the activities that they will want to implement in their community. And then there's a third phase where the community action plan is implemented and then we monitor and evaluate the impact of the project. But before we don't enter into partnership I would say that easily. We are a bit careful in the way we engage with municipalities and um, communities. So we do check a few things, like these are just criteria that we try to follow, which are the eligible criteria, I would say, to work to implement our projects. So we look at the size of the municipality, we look at the interest for the project, we do the research that I mentioned earlier, the surveys, to see what situation in the municipalities and what are the main problems. We also look if the municipality has any experience, previous experience working with FOPOs, and of course, the resources that are available in the municipality. 
One thing we do pay a lot of attention to is this. Making sure that we have the support of the mayor. Because without the support of a mayor, it's very, very difficult to achieve anything in the countries where we work. We don't want the stakeholders to be 100% dependent on the mayor because then we have the problem of political change. As soon as there's a political change, then we might have a new mayor who's not supportive. So we try to at least give some, I'd say, uh, some autonomy or, uh, or um, like we try to make sure that stakeholders will be able to continue the project even if there is a change uh, in, uh, in the municipality. In terms of identifying the stakeholders, we try to include everyone. We do, won't, don't want to leave stakeholders on the side. I know that somebody yesterday mentioned the importance of working also with the people who don't think the same way that you do. Well, we do that. For example, in these projects, we invite hunters, farmers, who are not always necessarily on the same side as the pet owners or the animal, local animal welfare NGOs. But it's important to speak to the people you, um, who are maybe opposed to what you are trying to do. And we try to involve them, of course, in the project. Community workshops, just very quickly. Uh, during the, we have a set of five workshops. During the first workshop, we work a lot on building trust, having common understanding on the root causes of stray dogs and consequences. Then we start looking at solutions. Then we finalize the action plan. We monitor and make the necessary improvements. And then we evaluate and we do the full handover of the project to the community. And that's where we actually um, become more of an advisor, an advisor. So we take more of an advisory role in the project. So I'm back to my tools. The first tool that I mentioned was the vet assistance and training. So we provide CNVR services, but we also help communities improve um, uh, vet standards in their community. And also we try to build vet capacities uh, in the different communities, municipalities where we, where we work. The next tool is a video, so I'm not gonna change it just in case it starts uh, straight away. It's our shelter adoption program. At Four Paws, we don't want to see sh dogs locked in shelters for all their life. We believe that shelters are just a temporary place before dogs find a new home. So we've developed a program called the Shelter Adoption Program to help shelters overcome the main obstacles to um, local adoption, but also to try to increase local adoption rate and build a local adoption culture in the, in the community. And we are actually right now launching the Shelter Adoption Academy. This academy is a free e-learning course which will be available for shelter staff and volunteers where they will have a set of, uh, the video explains it better, probably better than I do. So I'm gonna start the video. This is just the intro video to the uh, Shelter Adoption Academy. No sound? Sound please? Can we get the sound? Just gonna wait for that. Uh, three months. Thank you. 
So we um, we get a lot of requests from shelters for uh, for support. So we are trying to develop something that can be helpful sh for shelters. Uh, very often the requests are for funds, and it's very difficult to send funds to so many shelters. So we're trying to develop tools that can be helpful, and this is just the start of the shelter adoption program. So the first, the academy is just the first component, and we will also develop other tools that. Uh, hopefully can be useful for shelters to increase local adoption rates like campaigns or other things. The next video is about our animal assisted interventions program which was basically we what we do is we rescue and train former stray dogs to become therapy dogs and the objective of this program is to show the, 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 the community that former stray dogs can be of added value to the community. And we also want with this program to change attitudes and behaviors towards stray dogs. So I'm gonna launch this program. It's, uh, it's the one in Ukraine. Let's have it a bit. No, it's not it, that's it. I'm just gonna wait a second to see. Sometimes it starts, okay, there we go.
So in our projects, we are trying to encourage also committees to start their own projects, their similar projects. So with the idea of, get, again, that we don't do things for committee, but we help them do things themselves. And the last tool that I wanted to present is our responsible pet ownership program, where we actually run, uh, we raise awareness and we educate uh, pet owners, but also future pet owners, and also future generations of pet owners. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I know that I have two or three minutes left. So just a uh, quick word about the first pilot project that we conducted in Galatz, Romania, the first committee engagement pilot project. Between 20, uh, 2004 and 2009, we worked in this city in Romania, which had a huge problem with uh, stray animals. Um, during these years, we vaccinated and sterilized, I think, about 15,000 animals, and the, dog population, the stray dog population went down. But as soon as Forpaws left the project, the dog population started going up again, and nothing was done by the local municipality, by the local community, to uh, keep the dog population under control. So basically, the problem just came back. And this is how the project looked like um, during this period. Ten years later, the mayor called us, and this is what the, projects, the project looks like now. So we are working closely with stakeholders. We are engaging them. We are trying to give them ownership of their solutions. And it's showing actually great results. For example, the stakeholders have managed to amend um, a law that allows the police to do home checks in terms of uh, identification and registration of animals. They also set up a microchipping program working closely with the local vets. And they're doing a lot of work um, also on responsible pet ownership through uh, media posts, uh, campaigns, um, and others. And actually, they also managed to set up their own animal-assisted interventions program. So for rescued dogs from Galatz formed to, be, to become therapy, therapy dogs. So this is a great example. And this happened, as you can see, during a very difficult time uh, with COVID. Just a few words to say that we are a member of ICAM, which is the International uh, Companion Animals Management uh, Coalition. Uh, they provide a lot of very useful guides in terms of dog population management, uh, which are translated in various languages, including uh, Spanish. Um, that's it. And then I will just have a final few final remarks. Um, dogs need humans to take care of them all humans. Dogs become stray due to abandonment or being on the streets. The stray dog problem is a human problem and we need to focus, uh, I think I said it enough, but we need to focus on human attitudes and behaviors. We need to address not just the symptoms but the root causes. That's the most important thing we need to address. And dogs are part of the committee, therefore we should involve the whole community in developing solutions. And I would just say another word, maybe if you will allow me on how um, breeders can help, because I know that there are many breeders in the, in, the, in the room today. Well, breeders can help first by selling animals with a spay-neuter certificate, so that if these animals are abandoned, they don't um, contribute to um, making the dog population uh, grow again, but also, as I said before, by educating prospective owners on, uh, and maybe doing checks, but uh, um, um, educating prospective owners on uh, responsible pet ownership principles. Merci beaucoup, muchas gracias. Okay, questions. First of all, a very nice presentation. 
I come from the Southeast Asia, specific, specific, specifically the Philippines. And we're a perfect example of stray dogs and people having stray dogs. They keep stray dogs as house guards. They don't feed them. They feed them whatever they leftovers. We have stray dogs all over the country. Now, four paws isn't in the Philippines. Not yet. Okay. And so what we do in the club is that we, every, every biannually, we do give food to shelters. Although this is not a solution, but we help shelters. So if four paws would come in, I'm willing to talk to you guys in order to do our part. As a breeder, we also want to give back. And I think by giving back, we should also take care of these stray dogs. We have individuals now who are doing mass desexing, which is very good, but it's, it's not enough. So we need your help in the Philippines for an NGO as big as yours to come over, and I, 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 I myself will help. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I know it's not um, uh, a question, but um, um, we, we have an office. Uh, we do a lot of work in Southeast Asia. We're present in Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Indonesia. Uh, we have an office in, uh, in Bangkok. And uh, so one thing I can definitely do is put you in touch with my colleagues in Southeast Asia. Um, we get, of course, we can't help everyone. We have to be very honest. There's so much demand. There's so many problems everywhere. And we have to be very honest that we cannot help everyone. But we're doing our best, of course, with the resources that we have. And uh, yeah, and I hope that uh, we can put the Philippines on top of the, of the list. But I will definitely uh, come and see you to uh, share the contacts with my colleagues in, 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 in Thailand. And thank you. Um, do you plan to extend these programs outside of Europe? If so, how would you make a program like this in Mexico? Because we, we have a lot of um, stray dogs. So how would that be possible? Right. As I said, uh, we um, focus our efforts in Eastern Europe for the moment. Uh, we do have plans, but again, I can't confirm anything for the moment, but we do have plans to expand to Southeast Asia because we, those are two, are two focus regions, Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia. I know that there are other very good organizations that do similar work in Mexico, in Playa del Carmen, and in, um, um, I forgot the name of the other place. Anyway, sorry, I can't hear. Um, but of course, if we plan to expand, we would be more than happy to, uh, to come to Mexico. And we would be happy also to share anything we can that can really help you. Um, why not set up this kind of program? Because you are a vet student, and I know that we know that vets play a huge, important role in, in this project. Uh, I think there's a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Which one? <laughs> you. I'm from the United States, and I've been active in breed rescue since the 80s. And I'm seeing a change in attitude, um, how the shelters interact with the responsible breeders. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to extract dogs from your, your breed to do breed-specific rescue. It's getting more and more difficult to reclaim dogs that... Um, you know, were picked up because of death of the owner and the co-owners could not get the dogs. I'm, I'm seeing a great growing trend of the shelters and breeders becoming advocacies instead of partners in the United States. Is that elsewhere in the world as well and why? That's a good question. And. Um... I'm not sure I can answer that one spontaneously, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't think it's the case in, at least if I have to speak about Belgium, I don't have the feeling that it's the, uh, it's the case, but maybe uh, Eve will contradict me. Um, so, yes, I don't know if, 
Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer this one. <laughs> I need to think about it, but I'm ha I would be happy to come and see you afterwards and uh, dis discuss about it. I, I'm not really, really uh, specialized in um, the, 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 the relationship between breeders and, and shelters, but it's definitely something we need to look at. Um, thank you for your presentation. And my question will be, uh, you said the, um, the shelter adoption program, is that available for everyone or do you need to register in your country or can we apply it here in yes. Mexico? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's actually dedicated to, as I said, to shelter staff and volunteers. So that's our really target audience that we want to reach out to. Of course, if anyone wants to take it, it's free. So it's open to, uh, it's free of charge. I would be more than happy to, uh, to, to share it. It's going to be launched officially uh, to the public, I hope in two weeks time, because we're having last minute issues with, uh, with the platform. But then you, of course, as, I, as you said, you will, we will have, you will have to register uh, to be able to use the, um, the platform. But you're welcome to try to, uh, to, to use it. And I will be happy to um, to give you my email address after um, after the the day. You're welcome. Thank you very much, James. A round of applause, please, for James. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you.